Yeah. What's happening, guys? And welcome back to a delayed episode of the Bodybuilding Prospect with your host, Al, and myself. We've got a hell of a lot to dive into with what's been happening situationally, uh, especially with this big lovable lump above me. Um, so, Al, tell the people what has happened. Um, to put the long and short of it, I nearly died. So, <laughs> if you were to put it in a nutshell... Um, it's actually quite funny to even say that. Obviously, we laugh through most things, but it's pretty fucking savage, isn't it? When you actually get told people are going to save your life. Um, but for those that don't know, um, I was in a motorbike accident last week, uh, Saturday the Saturday the eleventh, <clears throat> about three in the afternoon. I was coming over a roundabout on my motorbike. wasn't even going fast, you know. For the record, people aren't be thinking how fast was I going. Um, it's two lanes coming off the roundabout. The guy in the left lane decided he wanted to go right at the last minute. So I T-boned him nicely um, and sent myself face first into the deck after colliding with the side of the car, like on my left-hand side, um, which uh, sent me into the floor. For those watching on YouTube, you're going to see the scar on my shoulder. That's road rash, which is healing up actually quite nicely. I was going to say, that's healed um, very quickly from what I saw in hospital. Yeah, that's growth hormone for you. <laughs> um, uh, but what had happened is as I'd hit the floor, like face first, I think my jacket had opened um, and my shoulder and my t- my T-shirt was mullered. It was annoying because you know how I cut my tops like Luke Sando used to, like explosive eight ones? It was one of those ones. Ah. So I was really, because they cut that off me in the ambulance as well. Um, so what had happened is obviously I've hit the side of the car and f- just... I remember making this noise and it was like along the lines of like that. And I continued to make that noise because I couldn't breathe. Um, it felt like if I thought my ribs were all broken, like, and they were just caved in um, cause it was just so tight on my chest. And I'm thinking, Oh my God, has one of my ribs got into my lungs? Am I going to die? Like, so I couldn't breathe. I, I cannot fucking stress enough to anyone. The fear that will go through you when you're, Literally, like I crawled on the road. I know I'm going to bounce between all sorts of thoughts here because that's what's going from my head at the time, but I crawled on the road. Um, don't know what I was crawling away from. I decided crawling because <laughs> I was just in so much pain. I don't know what the fuck was going on. And I leant, leant up against the curb, which is in the middle of the road. And I just leant up against it and was just struggling to breathe. People obviously come running over. The driver come running over and he started shouting some shit at me while I was on the floor. Um, but lucky enough, I've got... I had two friends there who saw to him quite quickly. Um, and then he eventually did stop talking. Um, I don't know if they, don't think they smacked him or anything. But um, I remember a lot of fucks being thrown and people were like arguing above me. And I'm thinking, people, I can't fucking breathe. And you're all shouting and screaming at each other. Like, and I'm just thinking, oh, what the fuck? Yeah, yeah, yeah man. Reading that, that moment, man. I remember just looking, I remember the sun was in my eyes. I was looking up like, fuck, don't shut up. A lot of you. Um, I just remember saying, like, I, just, I was people were like, oh, you're right. I was like, I just need an ambulance. I need an ambulance. I need an ambulance. That's all I said like three times. And they were like, they were like, yeah, ambulance on its way. Someone already called them straight away, which is quite nice. Like, it's the first thing, obviously, you want to know is someone's coming. Um, and quite cool enough, within, I'm not even joking, five, 10 minutes, an ambulance car had turned up. Um, and he was over to me, like, checking my neck and checking my back and stuff. Um, at this point, I'm all fully levered up still, like just laying, I'm laying in the middle of the road against the curb and they were like, oh, we need to move you. And I was like, don't move me, like, please don't move me. Because um, I, I was so worried that my ribs were snapped up and all sorts and, you know, you don't want to make an injury worse by like standing up and then causing more damage. Yeah. So I was like, I'm just going here. And everyone else, can, if there's cars, go around me, mate. Fuck off, I'm not moving. Um, so after that, the police turned up um they were just asking me some basic questions they again wanted to move me and i said no <laughs> like i'm not trying to be an arsehole i'm genuinely i can only just about breathe sitting here like i had to take i had to work out how i could breathe properly and i'm just taking like half breaths and i'm not exactly a small guy and either like, <laughs> so you're like you're, you're breathing quite quickly and the panic starts to set in and you just you just kind of trying to stay with it and um, i didn't go unconscious till any minute um i, I took my helmet off straight away um, which obviously heat at the moment, you know, you do that. But obviously the rule is you're not supposed to, but oh, there was no way I was sitting there in, you know, 25, it was the start of the heat wave, you know, <laughs> sitting there 
boiling my tits off, not being able to breathe. But lucky enough, I managed to get it straight off. Um, I was wearing, unfortunately, my fabric gloves on the day because um, it's their, their summer glove and you can see my hands are still quite cut up. Um, I don't know what they hit. They just hit the floor and obviously other stuff. And there was there were like a good few millimetre gash in my hand. Um, I'm confident these two knuckles are broken. I'll go into why, but I don't actually know why some things are broken and why some things aren't. Um, but I think these two knuckles are broken and I might have a small fracture in here with some heavy bruising. I'm very confident my thumb is broken um, because it is twice as fat as this one. And there's a lot of like black bruising around the nail and things like that. You know, we've all broken fingers in the past from punching stupid shit and all sorts. Um, yeah, you know, it is. Yeah. And um, it's funny because I can't do the loser sign, which is really funny. I mean, it's, not, <laughs> look, it's just awful. Yeah. It's, it's really funny because my dad's got an identical injury from his thumb from riding a motorbike. So me and him are the same. We call it the, we call it juicer. So <laughs> so that's a nice little joke we've got now. I take the piss out of him for years because of that. Um, but yeah, where did I get up to? So ambulance has come. Um, it was funny because they were like, we need to get this jacket off you. And I was like, I said, I should be able to get it off. You, you shouldn't have to cut it off me. Um and um, I was just saying, I was like, I'm not very flexible and it is quite tight on me. Like the jacket is quite tight. Yeah. And they were like, and the boy's like, he's a bit of a lump under there. You'll see it in a minute. <laughs> and I was like, we're trying to make a bit lighthearted of it. And they were like, oh, what'd you do? I was like, oh, I was just, I'd go gym and stuff, you know, just trying to play it down. Just <laughs> and then they took it off. They're like, oh yeah, he's a big guy. <laughs> um, but yeah, they got the jacket off me once the ambulance came, sat me in the back of the ambulance, fucking... Student paramedics were put forward first. Like they obviously said, oh, mate, I'm, I'm not one to take the piss and all that sort of stuff, but I ideally wanted the best person to be sorting me out. And they were getting the younger person to do all the shit to me, like put the drips in me and stuff like that. And I'm just sitting there thinking, please just make this pain go away. Because now the pain was setting in um, on, like, my, on my side. Um, the drops off, man. Once that epinephrine's gone out of the system, then you realise how much pain you're really in. Yeah. But I'll quickly, actually, I'll jump back a second because before that, so as I'm laying on the floor, I had this old lady um, who'd been, I found that she was in the car behind me and one of the cars behind and she was a nurse. She's like mid to late 60s, proper like nan vibes, if you know what I mean. I'm talking like heartwarming yeah. and I need to shout out this lady. I, I've, I tried, I put a post on a Facebook page and it got nearly like a thousand people involved in it trying to find out. Who... I've got people up this way that know Zoe's brother through the car yeah. racing and mechanics yeah. and things, all going, oh, isn't that your mate? Oh, like, it's gone around everywhere. Yeah. Man. No, it's, it's so, it's so cool. insane. So many people wanted to help because I knew, I've seen posts like it before when people are trying to find someone like to give thanks and I still haven't. I mean, I have a name because um, she said her name was Marion, Marion or Miriam. Um, and someone said, oh, it could be this lady, Mariam. And uh, um, I don't think she has Facebook or anything, so I'm still going to be pursuing who this lady is. But either way, she sat with me. I swear to God, mate, it was like a fucking angel. I'm not even lying. Like she, she said she was a nurse. She was like, I'm a nurse. She was, and she was like, I'm not just sitting here with you for no reason. Like, I, I, I'm a nurse. Um, and she had like my head in her hands. And she was like, just like running her hands through my hair. But I swear to God, mate, that shit chilled me out. Like I was freaking out like hell on the floor and she just made things cool. There was a fireman there as well. He also said, he was like, mate, I'm not just sitting around here for no reason. I said, I'm a fireman. So I'm here to help you. And I was like, sweet. I got her. I got him. I was like, I'm cool. Everyone else, fuck off. Yeah. Like, I don't need no one else around me. I had another lady come over with an umbrella trying to keep the sun off my head while I'm on the side of the road. It was just cool. Like I felt all right once it settled and I could breathe. And I got these people that are professionals, luckily enough, and fucking at the scene. Um, and so the ambulance come in, back of the ambulance, the fucking guy fucked up the cannula, put it in my arm. So they had to stab me twice to put that one in there. Um, gave me a uh, paracetamol on drip. I'll tell you what, mate, that shit's the nuts. Um, and no people say, oh, paracetamol, this, that, and the other. No, injectable paracetamol, that is the shit. I'll tell you now, people. Um, you might want to take that if you get offered it. Uh, they also gave me oromorph, oromorphine, that stuff banging as well. <laughs> um that's a harsh out of my operation, man. I had to throw it in the bin. Did you? Yeah, mate. You like my, my addictive personality, I was getting itchy when I come out of hospital because I wanted it. I had it on liquid form on a on a lock button. Yeah, that's what I got. Yeah, I got Every one of those. Every five oh, minutes, yeah. I was watching the clock so I could press this button and get my hit of morphine. It was that. Mate, it was, uh, oh, mate, that stuff's cool. The coolest thing is, is having the drip morphine on button, like you said. 
and the injectable paracetamol yeah. on top of it, mate. Them two together, mate, that'll level you out like no tomorrow. I swear to God, I was so chilled. It was unreal. I was flying in hospital. Yeah, I, you don't real you don't realize how much pain you're actually in until all the drugs go, and then you're like, oh shit, like, I'm actually in a lot of pain. As I'm, I'm, I'm actually on this for a good reason, um, and like you, you know, you realize if you forget to press the button or something, um, it's like, oh, I haven't pressed it in a while, but then you press it, and it's like, oh, there it is. Because it goes straight in. That's a merit um, to your personality trait there, because there was not a minute I forgot to press that button. <laughs> No, I wanted to make sure I wasn't being a tit with it. I mean, I did need it because I was very uncomfortable for a long time. Need it. Um, I think the severity of what you're about to say next kind of indicates yeah. why you had it. Yeah, and I'll tell you some other funny things about what some of the ner- what a nurse said when I got to the hospital, which is really funny considering what happened afterwards. Um, so I'm in the back of the ambulance. They've cut my T-shirt off me um, and... They started taking the piss out of me because <laughs> I was like, I was like, just so you know, I do take steroids in case it, it does get involved in anything you're doing. I'm completely, completely transparent with it. Um, they just started taking the piss out of me. They were calling me insecure and shit like that. I said, look, I said, I was a fat kid of scores and this is where I'm at. She said, yes, because you're insecure, isn't it? And I was like, I do not need this. I do not need this right now. And it was like, she, she had like mum vibes, this lady. Yeah. She was like, yeah, I've got two sons like you and all that sort of stuff. And I was like, and she was just cool. It made it a bit lighthearted again. Um, but it was sound better than one of the guys was like ex Royal Air Force uh, medic and stuff like that. just sorted me out you know keep an army doing all my pressures and things like that um, so we're in the ambulance on the way to the hospital my friends fortunately enough managed to sort getting my bike put on a trailer by another friend because I also got told if they if the police have to take your vehicle you'll be paying a fortune to get it back for you know in pound and things like that. so lucky enough the boys sorted me out I will be sorting them out once I'm fucking a bit more able to be about. We've got loads of people to sort out, to be honest, mate. So many people got their heads together for me. Um, so I've gone to the hospital in the ambulance. It wasn't like blue light job each of the ambulance, like rushing. I'm not going to butter this up like something it ain't. Um, purely because I was in a, I was pretty stable after um, they gave me all that injectable stuff and I was like chilling. I couldn't walk. I walked like hobgoblin like crept over my side and stuff like that and not that anyone would want to carry me anyway um because they did try and say oh, can you step into the ambulance like um, and and said that was that was able to do that like very slowly so we got to the hospital i'm like walking into the hospital with the people and just like leaning up against the wall like can barely with it you know i'm a little bit white in the face and stuff um they walked me into the trauma ward and they were like they were like oh this bed's saved for someone like for a trauma and they were like, yeah, it's him. And they were like, motorbike accident. And they were like, yeah, it's him. Like, it's his guy. And I'm thinking, like, what am I doing? And the doctor was like, sweet, lay down. Like, they took my trousers off me. They put loads of pads and shit on me. They did a fast scan, which is like what they do with pregnant ladies with the gel stuff. And they were checking over, like, my sides because I said, obviously, where the pain was and things like that. And they were slowly touching me up. Like, no, not touching me up, but, you know, they were, like, feeling my hips, my shoulders, my neck, things like that. And you know what's mad? Like, considering I got twatted by a car, to not have my hip fucking broken or my ribs broken was really strange. But the shit part it was, it did get all the squishy stuff, which I'll go into in a minute. Um, So done the far... You're lucky. You're lucky that it wasn't brown spine, neck, hips. It could have been a much worse situation. People don't have a bike accident as lucky as you. I know it wasn't exactly an ideal situation, but... It is, it is, because they were saying, they were like, they were like, oh, like, you seem, f- that's what, that's the annoying thing, that's when the severity went down a bit, because nothing else was busted, and obviously you got to think, so, obviously, your ribs are in front of your organs, so when they're doing the fast scan, the ribs cast a shadow on your organs, so they couldn't see quite a lot, so from the initial fast scan, they saw nothing, and the nurse said, he reckons it was uh, just like bruised ribs, and I'd probably be discharged in a few hours, right? <laughs> And this is where he comes to eat his fucking words because of what I got told later on. So I'll get put into a daytime ward, um, which is like day-to-day stuff, like people coming in feeling like nauseous, sick, checkups, been in hospital for a little bit. This is a space to put them, like, cast aside, essentially, whilst I'm waiting for a space to get a CT scan. Um, first time getting a CT scan, this was. So I'm sitting there for about probably an hour and a bit, a couple of hours, maybe even a couple of hours, I'm there, like, starting to make the phone calls, obviously, to my girlfriend, Els, um, and my mum and my stepdad. They're the only people I want to speak so far. And I didn't put anything on social media straight away because I knew this one was a bit worse. 
And last time, because I had an accident the year before, and I did the stupid thing of putting it on Instagram while I was in the ambulance. Yeah. Your phone just blows up. like no, And you are not in the right place. Don't get me wrong. Like, it's nice to have the messages and things, that, and everyone's amazing. But it was cool to sit there and be like, do you know what? I'm so glad my phone isn't kicking off like it was last time. You know, you're just talking to your family, your close ones, people that deserve to know first, now know, and we're finding out what's going on. I'm um, privileged to say that I was next on that call list as well. <laughs> yeah, George, George was as well. Um, of course, like I said, the necessary people know. <laughs> you actually knew before my brother did. <laughs> he was well pissed, mate, that he didn't find out fucking one of the first people. Um uh, so I'm there I just couldn't get comfortable sitting in this fucking bed like, I'm talking you just couldn't I was something was and mate the bloat was starting and now we know that bloat was internal bleeding <laughs> so I could feel my stomach yeah, like, internal bleeding yeah <laughs> becoming in, becoming distended and I was like this is it felt, it felt different I could feel like squishing like yeah. like you know like you squeeze like water out of a bag like it's like like it's going all around like and that was i'm guessing fluid and other substances moving around my body and shit um and my abdomen was just so bloating it got uncomfortable i was like i really need the toilet um but i still couldn't go because i was like i'm just still mogging out on this fucking drip um uh so Els has come down to the hospital in this time so i think that's about an hour gone by by the time she got there because she's obviously come from whitstable which is 40 odd minutes away um She's there with me, funnily enough, whilst, because she hadn't eaten all day or drunk anything and she'd worked like a fool. The lady behind her started throwing up and all of a sudden Elle was like, oh, I don't feel too good. Ellie fainted next to the bed, right? And lucky enough, you know those things on wheels that go over the bed like a platform? Yeah. Lucky enough, she landed with her chest on this wheelie thing and it gradually wheeled forward and like kind of rested her onto her knees and like onto the floor. I've reached over. I've got these fucking pads all on my chest and I'm hooked up to this fucking drip. My ribs of this time, I think, are fucked. I've reached over. I grabbed her by the sports bra. She was a sports bra at the time. So I grabbed her by the strap and like it's pulled me over and like, I just couldn't grab onto her. She ended up still going onto the floor. And I just remember shouting like, help, help, like, help. <laughs> Mate, six people come tearing in, fucking picked her up, put her on the bed next to me. <laughs> Doing her blood pressure, her blood pressure was really low. You see, she's just full fucking not getting enough fluids in, no food. Um, but they gave her like a sandwich and drink thing, and she came back a little bit. But it was mad, like she was like she kind of like perked up, like what the fuck just happened? Like, yeah, like d- dazed. And I was like, You just you just fainted. She was like, Really? I was like, Yeah, like you just passed the fuck out. Um, but after a while, she was she was fine. I think just it was a bit claustrophobic in there, it was hot. There's six other people in there. Lady behind was throwing up. It's not. It's a bit of a funny environment. And she's just coming and seeing you splattered on the bed. And she's come to see me pretty beaten. Like she saw my sh- my shoulder was obviously very like it, it was like a caramelized apple, mate. It was so oh. glazed and it just looked like that was. Just, I was. I looked at it and I was. Oh, that's what road rash looks like. Um, but like I said, I was wearing full leathers. It just opened my jacket. I'm not a tit that rides about leathers. Um, and then. I get lined up for my CT scan, so I get wheeled down the corridor. The fucking bloke, the porter, as they're called, he did not want to wheel me about. He, he was done for the day. He, he, someone had pissed him off. He was not in the mood. You know, I'm just getting wheeled down the corridor. He's got a face like a slapped ass. He dumps me outside of the CT place. Um, and I was thinking, oh, like, I need to, I was like, oh, can you put the sides down on the bed? And I was like, I need to go to the toilet. And uh, he helped me sit up nicely enough of him because... I didn't think he would. And actually, I found out that not even supposed to do that. Because if I hurt myself while him helping me up, he's not covered by it. Um, but lucky enough, he's a geezer and he did help me up. Um, and I went to the toilet. I'm just like hobbling. I'm in my pants, bear in mind. I'm just hobbling like to the toilet. And I left the door unlocked just in case something happened in the toilet. You know that like you're pranging out a little yeah. bit. I just in case happen. So I left the door unlocked and I've gone to go to the toilet and go for a pee for the first time. And my good God, mate, all that came out was black currant. I swear to God, and there was lumps in it, like which turns out to be blood clots. Um, I'd never peed blood before in my life. Scary. Um, I just froze, mate. I was looking at it, and I was like, yeah. "I need to go. I need to go speak to someone. <laughs> I um, need to go hospital. <laughs> I need to go hospital. I mean, I'm here. But was come out the doors. Obviously, the, the doors are close to the CT scan people, and there's just this lady and her son who turns out I end up speaking to afterwards. Um, he had appendicitis. Um, 
And it was funny because I was like, is there any doctor around? I need to speak to someone. I've just found something out. And I didn't want to tell them what I'd found. And, and she was like, she was like, oh, they should come out in a minute. Um, but I go sit down if I were you, because if you fall over, I won't be able to pick you back up. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, okay, that sounds like a good idea. So I hobble back over to my bed and get in it. And a few minutes later, the CT scan opens up. They come out and get me. And they were, I was like, oh, can I? I've just peed blood. Like, I don't know what to do. She's like, I'll just tell the doctor in a minute. We'll get this out of the way first. Had a CT scan for the first time. That was strange. Um, was he, they checked like my full body near enough. Um, it's in there about five, 10 minutes or so. Uh, and then I started getting towards the end of the scan. I started getting these shooting pains in my stomach and I'm talking like sharp, just like stabby shooting pains. And I couldn't, I was like, I was like, I said, I said I'm not a soft person. I said, I'm not, a, I'm not a faggot. Like this is really hurting me. And normally the port is supposed to take you back down, obviously, to where you're going to go. Yeah. And I said, I, I said, I really need to speak to the doctor. Like, now, can you please get me to him? And the lady, the CT lady wheeled me down, very much half the length of the hospital where yeah. I was going to. And she wheeled me down there and the uh, lady come and saw me. I said, oh, I've just passed, passed blood. She took a little note of it and just left me there again for a minute, did my blood, uh, did my blood pressure stuff again. And then, <laughs> sorry, as a lady come back around to do my blood pressure, she got the cuff on my arm. And she's just like doing the routine blood pressure stuff. A lady comes like rushing in and she goes, I need to take him now. And the lady goes, what, him? Like right now? And she's like wide-eyed like this. She was like, right now. And I was like, I was like, oh, am I in trouble? And she just went like, her eyes like flicked down at me and then flicked back up at the other lady. And I was like, oh shit, I'm, I'm, I'm in trouble here. Like something's gone on. And they wheel me out. They fucking, where do they take me then? They took me, they took me to resus um which turns out to be a bad place you don't want to be in there because <laughs> it turns out you're in a bad way if you go to resource um and the surgeons come in who found out to be a surgeon a few out for three four other people are darting around me like on the computers geezer's on the phone turns out he's on the phone to king's hospital um because it turns out um I, I might have been out i might have had to go there and um, he was on the phone to a consultant up there obviously he was a consultant here talking to a consultant up there going through my CT scan because they'd found bleeding and my kidney was mullered and my spleen was double mullered. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I had a, I've got, well, had uh, a grade four out of five spleen laceration um, and a grade three out of five kidney laceration to one of my kidneys um, and some wonderful bleeding on the inside. Um, they did a fast scan again, still didn't find any. That's what the, I think they were just testing it to see how fucking stupid this was. Because you got a CT scan showing me I'm battered, and the fast scan stuff not showing anything because you just wouldn't, couldn't see anything. Um, and the guys, they got the, the surgeons come in, uh, and my consultant, and he's like, Right, here's what's going on. He was like, Your your spleen is mashed. I was like, Oh, that's what that's that's his exact words. He said it was mashed. I was like, Great, so that's not good. <laughs> um and he said your kidney's taking a bit of damage as well um uh, bear in mind at the time my hands are fucked as well but they did not care obviously give a fuck about the hands because they they obviously had bigger problems yeah. to go and i'll go on to in a minute what they did with the hands um and so he's on the phone to kings and going through my results there and he was are oh, they they're just discussing whether you need to go to london or not um because we do need to do surgery i was like this one i start fucking panicking because i'm thinking shit like that's, that's me getting cut open. You know, I've never had an operation in my life ever. Never needed one. Fortunately enough, touch wood. Don't need to have any others. Um, and he just says, yeah, like your spleen needs to come out. Um, he says, if it stays in there, it's just going to keep bleeding and bleeding and bleeding. And it's going to cause you a lot more problems. Um, and he says, we need to see what your kidneys are looking like as well. Fortunately enough, after that, they... Um, Oh, we're going to the first bit. So I've got all the paperwork coming over. They're so, I'm signing shit, mate. I don't like signing stuff like that. Because uh, it's like signing for blood transfusion if I need it, the risk of the surgery, next of kin, contact details for family members. And I tried to make a light joke. I said about bodybuilding. I said, oh, if you're going to cut me over, I was like, can you make the scar neat? And he said, um, he said, he said, that's not my priority. He said, my priority is saving your life. And I was like, for fuck's sake, mate. Like, that hits you, man, when they say that. Lit, mate. I, you, you know me, man. I, I make light of any any situation. I tried it again on this one, but he weren't having none of it. He just kept it real um, and just said that. It was, and that was when I, I said to him, this is straight up, I said, 
I said, I'm probably going to have a bit of a breakdown in a minute. Like, I've, tears were coming in my eyes. I'm laying, like, just flat on my back. Like, my girlfriend's not even there at the minute. Because lucky enough, she had gone to meet my mum at the front of the hospital to pick up, like, phone charger, iPad, because I was, was going to be here a while. Um, so I managed to digest this on my own for, like, a few minutes. So I had the surgeon, the consultant to the right of the bed, the surgeon to the left of the bed. They both got, like, their hands on the rail, and they're just looking at me, essentially, like, waiting for my reaction or seeing how I'm dealing with the information. They're just telling me how it is and just pretty much saying, like, we need you to lie still. We need you to chill out. Like, we're going to operate you in a bit. We're going to get you in as soon as we can. Um, because someone was already having uh, surgery in the theatre before me. Um, and, yeah, just saying, like, like do you essentially, do you vouch for it to do it? Um, but I, I didn't really have an option. You know, you, they're saying, oh, you need to have surgery. Yeah, like, just so you know, like, you're going to, you, we're going to do that. Um, uh, but what they said about, you say no? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I can't exactly say no. Um, they, they said about uh, my mum's contact details. Um, and they said, I said, ah, oh, I said, do you mind? This is, this is getting on to about nine, 10 o'clock at night now. And I've been there since five quarter past five um he said oh we need to let your next of kin know about the operation i said oh can could we could you just like keep me in do the operation and i'll speak to him tomorrow um because i don't want my family worrying like overnight if i'm going to have like, an emergency surgery um he was like he was like you either call her or i'm going to call her and i was like oh, you fucking dick like this he, he what i loved about him mate it, and i say he's a dick but i don't mean it too much like he's just keeping it real um no emotion. Um, a, huh? No emotions whatsoever. That's it. That's their job. That is it. He is saying, as it is, I'm just another geezer on the table he's working with. Do you know what I mean? He, he kept it very distant. There was no... I made him laugh a couple of times. I will say I'm proud of that. Because um, I, sp I spudded him after I asked him to take pictures of the surgery. I was like, sweet. Like, see you in a bit. Because <laughs> um, I said, I was like, oh, do you mind getting some pictures? And he was like, what do you mean? I was like, oh, can you get some pictures? Like, why are you doing it? Like, I want to see what it looks like. Um, <laughs> Go away. Um, sorry, someone trying to FaceTime me. Um, yeah, so can you get some pictures? He was like, yeah. He said, I said, do you mind? It'd be on my phone. Do you mind? And I was like, nah, just crack on. Like, just get some pictures. I was like, take a selfie if you want. Yeah, <laughs> while you're doing it. Um, I actually said that as well. And he, he did get a little smirk out of him, and I spudded him. And uh, he went off to go still look at the scans and stuff. Uh, so I'm sitting there with the other guy. He was like, um, I'm not sure where he's from. He had a cool accent. But he was just saying, like, it's chilled. He was like, he was like, you're stable. It's cool. Like, we've got a plan now. Everything's cool. He was like, as soon as like this geezer's come out, the sur the other surgery, we'll get you in. Um, I had two meetings. Like, obviously, like the way it goes, you have like the anesthesist comes around. Yeah. She introduces herself. She tells me what she's gonna do. Mate, she loved her job. Her name was Camilla. I remember. Um, she was like, pretty much. She was like, I'm the person who's gonna put you to sleep. Make sure you're all safe and comfy while you're asleep. Uh, make sure you make sure no one touches you or messages you while you sleep. And then when you wake up, I'm gonna give you loads of drugs and make you feel really good, and I'm gonna keep you safe again. Like I was like, I said to her, I was like, "You love what you do, didn't you?" She was like, "Yeah." She was, like, "I love what I do." And she was cool. Yeah. Huh? She gets the good bit of the job there. Yeah, she, she just made me feel cool. Um, another lady come round. She I think she's another nurse. I think there was like rolling the nurses, like just checking up on me, pressures, blood tests, stuff like that. Um, and eventually. Uh, the consultant comes in, he's all kitted up in his, you know, the blue scrubs. Uh, and he was like, I'll be ready for you now. And I'm like, oh, sweet. Here we go. Um, and they take me, I'm not sure if they took me to another room first. You usually yeah. go to that you go into like a pre bay before you go into the theater. Yeah, that was it. I went in there and I remember these two girls because one of the girls actually went to my school funnily enough she was part of the surgical team um, and she come and got me uh, with another lady he was like here we go go Ellie's with me follow me down and that's like before you get into the double doors this is as far as Ellie can go yeah Ellie's then had to go like wait in the car essentially like wait around for me to do the surgery um, go in they put like they introduced me to another couple of people, um, all cool guys, good energy about them, just saying, oh, we're going to get it done, blah, blah, blah. Strap you into this board, like lift me onto the thing, da, da, da. Um, and then put the mask over me and they were like, oh, here we go. They were like, she was like, I just keep taking deep breaths. This is just oxygen. And it's like, 
you can feel shit getting faint, like like it's obviously pure O2 going in. Um, and then she was like, oh, here we go. And I think that's when she did the injection, um, obviously into my cannula. And it just, you know, like a nostril, like it goes echoey and faint. And it was like, and all of a sudden, mate, I'm in dreamland. And <laughs> it was, it didn't last long, I'll be honest. It, feel, it felt like, like people, it was my first ever time I've been put on anesthesia. It does feel like 10 minutes when you actually piece it together. Oh, how long did it feel like asleep or whatever? Because you just just woke up again. And it was the hilarious thing, I woke up in this dark room and uh, it was, I think it's like the recovery bay. And fortunately, because it was an emergency surgery and there was no other surgery supposed to happen on this day, I had it all to myself. And I remember like waking up a bit, a lady's like on, behind a computer in front of me and she just pokes her head up above the screen. She goes, hello, Alex. <laughs> like, <laughs> And I and I think I must have dozed off again. And then she's like next to me next time I wake up playing with some stuff. I doze off again. I wake up and my girlfriend's there. And then she was just there on her own with the with the surgeon, I think. And I doze off again. She comes come up. I wake up and my mum's there with my stepdad and Els is there and the surgeons and everyone's there. And I'm a bit more with it, having a little chat. Um. And yeah, that was that was after the surgery, but uh. And there was a lot, obviously, that went on. And after that, they, I'm just chilling there, um, doing like a little bit of a debrief, letting me come to a bit. And I was, because I hadn't eaten for, God damn, how many hours? I think I went 27 hours without food in total. Christ. Yeah. I have never gotten that long without food in my life. Lucky enough, when you're beating up to shit, you're not hungry anyway. But I just knew... Because I didn't eat till like from like I I went out on my bike at about two o'clock, and I hadn't eaten since like one, um, which I didn't even eat, didn't even eat all of it. I left. I was like, oh sweet, I'll have it when I come back. Cause I'm even hungry, and I I had beef and rice sitting in my microwave still, like to come back to, um, which you know we didn't end up coming back to. Um, and then I'm in hospital for uh, uh, for six days in total. Um, see George obviously spoke to George every day, and fucking numerous other people. Uh, had over 200 people message me, which was amazing. Friends, family, Instagram people, all awesome positivity, nothing negative. The only thing, the only stupid fucking thing that some people might have said was, oh, that's your bodybuilding fuck then. What kind of a fucking idiot would say that to someone? That's one thing I will say, because they always say the negative comment of all of them will stand out. What kind of a twat have you got? All, got all these thoughts running through your head of the implications of this surgery is going to have. That's already running through your head. The last thing you need is some fucking idiot on Insta being like, oh, yeah, that's bodybuilding done then, isn't it? Yeah, oh, that, that's, that's, that's your bodybuilding fuck then, mate, isn't it? And yeah. a few other people are like, oh, when are you back to training? I'm like, I don't think you realise what's just happened, mate. Like, I've lost a spleen and my kidney's a bit battered, mate. I think I'm going to yeah. chill on the weights for like a good fucking month. Yeah, and I've now got an abdominal wall that fucking four millimetres thin. You know, I don't think I'm putting any fucking tension on that anytime soon. Yeah. You, it. <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't even entertain those messages. I was, I was too busy talking to other people. I had so many cool conversations with people. Um, some people that had driven past me while I was on the floor. Um, they didn't know it was me. Um, people that had had motorbike accidents before and not got motorbikes. People that have had friends that have died and people that have had like surgeries themselves. And it was awesome um, because it kept me into. I went through probably about two phones worth of battery a day, easy, just by talking to people. Yeah. Um, just going to caveat. Just going to caveat this quickly. So Al rings me yeah on the day this happens, <laughs> and he starts the conversation like he would do anyway. It's the normal way. Hey, doing are you going? Yeah. Oh starts talking about my client stuff, asking me how my guys are going, how prep's going, before two, three minutes in, slipping in, oh, yeah, by the way, I got hit by a car on my bike, I'm in hospital. Like, <laughs> my head just exploded. I'm sat there trying to talk to him about fucking client shit, people prepping, and he just drops that bombshell. Me. I'm like, Next time, start the fucking conversation with, by the way, I've just been dashed by a motor. Yeah, but you, you, know, you don't want to be that guy who just calls and talks about himself. <laughs> yeah, <but that's, laughs> you're allowed to when it's this serious, man. Jesus. Is so funny. My mum said she was like, You're such a fucker. Because she was like, When you called me, so she, she said, You played it down like it was last time. Because last time when I had my motorbike accident, I didn't, I only dislocated my shoulder and broke a couple of fingers. Um, and I, I said, Because you don't want to let your mum worry. And, and lucky enough, I did play it off exactly how I wanted it to. I didn't want her to worry as much. She didn't for the least amount of time she possibly could. 
um, until they found out um, they were going to fucking take my spleen out. So I'm an organ down currently. Well, um, looks good on the scale weight though, doesn't it? Yeah, well, it's a, I actually Googled how much does a spleen weigh. It's around 300 grams for a spleen. Yeah. So, you know, I can make weight a little bit easier on certain things. <laughs> I've got to make. You, might have to, you might have to turn the classic now if you can make weight cap. Yeah, I mean, I've got some considerations to make, you know. I mean, how this will affect my bodybuilding health-wise. Of course, I've got... I sent Joe a loan video today for the first proper time. Like, I actually sent a loan video to him, like, just explaining how the week had gone. Because he said to me, he says, look, once you're settled, speak to me and we'll, we'll have a game plan. Obviously, we'll enhance the shit out of this and science the shit out of it to have my recovery as smooth as possible. Fortunately enough, my recovery has been nothing short of amazing so far. And... To have doctors saying, look, your post-op's perfect, like you're doing well, nothing's fine. Blood pressure only dropped a little bit, but that's just due, due to like fluids and, you know, being immobile for so like for a long period of time. Because you can easily sit in bed all day. Like some people will happily sit in that bed all day unless the nurses poke them to get out of it. Yeah. Um, I didn't have to have a nurse sponge bath me or anything like that, fortunately enough. I did have, I, I couldn't obviously bend over and wash my legs and stuff, but I could reach the obvious areas. Um, it's not very nice, I'll be honest. You're in a very warm ward and fucking air con had packed in. So everyone's got a fan on them, but it's just blowing hot air around the room. And I was in like, a, I was in a post-op ward. Kings B was the ward I was in. So shout out to the ladies there. They were fucking amazing. All of them. Um, just so chilled. Nothing they hadn't seen before. You know, you're sitting there with, so obviously I've woken up with a catheter coming out of me. Um, I've got a cannula coming out of my arm, my right arm, or a cannula coming out of my left arm. I've got a waste tube coming out of my stomach from the area where they operated on, which is attached to a blood bag. So obviously to, to get any fucking blood out, that's like seeping. Um, so I've got a few tubes coming out of me uh, when I've woken up. Uh, and I'm sitting there with that in me and trying to live essentially or like exist with that all coming out of you is a little bit shit because if you move funny, you dig in and like bits of tape come, we were all clammy in this hot room, you know, bits of tape are coming undone and like, <sighs> there is nothing weirder than a drain, like then picking up your catheter pipe. So the urine passes down into the bag. I was going to say, when I, had, when I had my lung done, I had to walk around with this mobile gravity thing that was keeping my lung inflated. And it was literally like a little plastic handbag. And I used to carry around, it was attached into my lung. And I was, it's the most weirdest thing because when you're initially getting used to having it, you feel it pull and tug and it's like, uh, 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 yeah. yeah 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 that already giving me the little fucking throwback of how that feels. i know like because you've got something sticking out of you that shouldn't be there then, there's a hole then, that's not meant to be there like it's literally it's like yeah there's a hole in my side currently and there's a tube coming like going through it um and it's holding on by one stitch like to your skin yeah. <laughs> holding it in. um fortunately enough uh the kappa to come out after a couple of days it got stuck three times trying to get it no sorry the third time they got it out but three times it took them to pull it out the nurse she was i'm not gonna lie it does suck like getting these pulled out just take a deep breath and we'll get it out and that's it so i'm sitting there she was ah oh, do you mind me pulling the you know the sheet off you or is he gonna be a bit exposed i was like look just crack on there's no dramas here like i know you're here to do a job sitting like <laughs> And I'm like taking a deep breath, I'm like, like holding on to the side, but I can't grip because my sides hurt so much, you know, I'm still in a lot of pain and I can't tense my stomach because I've been sliced open, you know, so you can't brace, like you just like this, like, and she pulls it and I'm like, Bleh! like, no, it's not going. And because, but because I'm so tense, that's why it's not coming out. And she was yeah. like, oh, that's supposed to happen. I'm like, oh no, it's not, is it? Like, Cheers like, for the update, right? Just what I want to hear. <laughs> I was like, it's all right. I said, we'll get it done. You know, I'm, I'm motivated. Let's get it done. Let's go. Come on, we'll get it done. <laughs> and, uh, Hyping yourself up preset. Yeah, honestly, like, and I'm in, I'm so feeble at this point. I'm like, I'm in pain and it's just not nice. And eventually it comes out. And honestly, it felt like my insides have been pulled out for a few seconds. It is a horrible feeling. I was pre-warned. They said it would suck and it does suck massively. Um, and obviously you get a bit of fucking dribble come out at the end of you afterwards and then like you got this little nappy underneath you. It's not, it's not you know, getting nice, Ben, but honestly, nurse didn't even bat an eyelid, you know, nothing she ain't seen before. Well, that, that's their day to day, you know, man. They, they see this shit in a regular yeah. normal life. Yeah. I think they were more fortunate I was a younger guy because most of the guys are like 60 plus on this ward. Yeah. And for all, all sorts, I'm talking like 
cancer operations, fucking falls, broken bits, or just post-op ward. So anyone's had an operation be on this ward. Um, and then I've got obviously the blood bag on my side. That after a few days, that bag. It felt like someone had their finger just constantly digging in my... I must have rolled over in my sleep and, like, jagged it or something. So I do move in my sleep. Um, and I said, one morning, they were like, oh, it's coming out today. I said, oh, please, can you do it soon? Because, like, I'm in, I'm in so much pain. Uh, I was getting better every day. And then it was the only day that I was in more pain than I was the day before. Yeah. And she was like, just so you know, this one's going to suck as well. I was like, oh, fuck's sake. And I was already... I was that, like, sort of feeble and, like, pain like sensitive when she was pulling the dressing off my stomach and it was pulling my body hair mate it felt like someone was waxing me near and it was just so painful and i was like but you haven't got a choice you have to obviously go through the motions and wherever that six in the morning it's coming out like it's happening and i said to her i said like, oh, i'm not going to freak out and grab you i was like i can't just put my hand on your shoulder so i've got something to like push against she was yeah it's perfect fine and she pulls that that was nothing that just came straight out that was cool it was weird though, didn't it? Because you could feel the tube inside moving as it comes out. No, this one was different. It wasn't in that. It's only in like that much like right. into my stomach. So it was a bit different to probably your one. It was the catheter that felt like it was right up inside me. Um, but yeah, so as the days went on, less and less tubes in me. Your family's checking up on me, blah, blah, blah. Um, so the most piss taking thing of all of this was, uh, you know, you've got the buttons on the bed. Like, yeah. Next to you. I didn't know there was a remote for the bed. So for six days, I'm tossing and turning to press these buttons and putting myself in a lot of pain just to adjust the bed. There's a fucking control underneath, mate, that I could have used. Yeah. And on the day that I'm leaving is when I find this button. Because I'm sitting on my chair next to the bed. I look down, I'm like... I literally said out loud, I was like, yeah, I'm going to fucking laugh. <laughs> you have to fucking laugh. Because... That is a piss take. I even took a video and put on my story. I was like, really? Like, this is just, this just makes it, doesn't it? Um, oh, I had so many people come visit me, call me, miss me. It was great. Can't, you cannot get down when you've got so many people messaging you, like letting you know if it's all cool. Um, of course, I have my own worries still. You know, I've been a motorbike lover for a whole life. And now I'm the guy who's had the serious motorbike accident and had the fucking major surgery and organ removed and I've got to take medication for the rest of my life and all that sort of stuff. I'm not going to butter the whole medication thing. But it's not, oh my God, I've got to take meds forever or I'm going to die. Like just my immune system is more impaired than the next person's. Um, my organs, my other organs, like kidneys, things that will take over more so now that's gone. But I will have to take like a small amount of penicillin every day, twice a day. Um, and I will be more susceptible to serious, uh, serious infections and illnesses. Like say if I do get ill, I'm more likely to suffer more so than a normal person because I don't have a spleen. And so hopefully I don't get any serious illnesses in my time. You'll have to watch your digestion as well. Penicillin's not great on the GI, man. Yeah, I mean, we're going to obviously science shit out of this and my health is going to become utmost priority on micronutrients, <laughs> beyond so more so with also vitamins, minerals, everything. Like that. I've got to be on top of it because I'm just not going to be... I'm not the same as everyone else now. Not optimal. Um, I'm not optimal. I am oh, less optimal. optimal. The next man is more optimal than I am because he has more organs than I have. Um, so taking it a bit deep here, man, but have you have you contemplated? I know we've spoken, but for the people listening, have you contemplated what this has changed in your life, like priorities, perspective? Has oh, the right. has the the end goal of where you're heading in life? Is that taken a massive shift yet or is it still something you're settling with because there's obviously a lot of post-operation post-trauma emotion yeah. come out psychologically that are mm. gonna fluctuate big time over the next month or so yeah i mean i've had a lot of thinking to do when you're sitting in a hospital bed and you honestly you you get to it, it full-on toe punted me 10 foot this way behind and you get to have a whole look at your whole life, like A to B, where whatever you've done, you get to, you get to look at all of it. It's such a cool feeling because I got to look at everything I'm doing. Like, this is what you do, you know, you bodybuild, you train, you got your business, you your railway, you, you know, you work a lot, you're busy, you got you see your partner, your friends, family, like this is your life. Like this is how you, this is where you're going, this is where you want to go. I was thinking, do you want to do it? And at the time I was thinking, I could fucking change things now. Like I could, I could have a look at other avenues, you know, 
fuck it. Like, do I want to do another sport? Do I want to do want to sack this off? Because I have to weigh up everything as if I might not be able to do bodybuilding again. Like the things that come into that are my risk with my health now. Um, no, I'm now more susceptible to more serious things. Potentially with the spleen is not too much of a major concern. Yeah. But mm-hmm. the kidney was, the minute you said about the kidney, my, my alarm bell started ringing in my head because that obviously changed yeah. the trajectory of enhancement use and, and stuff. And the kidney is still not, we don't have an answer yet for yeah, that. Exactly. So I've still got another CT scan to have on my kidney to see how they're preparing. But to be graded three out of five for a kidney injury is still high. Yeah. And high they're going to be... Higher than what you want because they were both from the top end of the scale and like one more level and one and it would have got removed. So, and that's really fucking peak. So we've got another CT scan coming up in about four weeks to see how the kidneys hold up. They didn't touch it; they just left it because it was, it was uh, the laceration of the spleen was every like it was leaking and shit, so it's going everywhere. But the kidneys, it was like it's like, it's in like a they said it's in like a bag, like a like a seal, and it's inside, so it's contained. So hopefully it will heal itself nicely and be functioning like a normal kidney. I haven't got to have it removed. To be honest, if I have to have that other one removed, then I, our bodybuilding is probably done. I, I can, I, it, well, as in uh, pushing the max of bodybuilding, should we say, will probably be done. And I've already even thought about what if you were just a muscle model forever? What if you were just a smaller competitor in other federations, what if that's got to be your limit? And I, I'm trying to get myself to the point where I'm okay with that because if you can't control it, what what, what am I going to do? Just sit down and break down? You it's know? a little bit annoying for you at the moment. It's all hypothetical talk until you know about the kidney. And until yeah. that's kind of set in stone, this is what's going to happen or it's getting better or whatever. It's hard to kind of make the decisions preemptively. But it does put a lot in pers- into perspective, like, I, I, I just always reference back to when I had my op. It completely, oh, shaped, yeah. completely yeah. shaped my life. That whole six months post-operation recovery phase made me sit here and look at everything I'd done with the raving, drugs, everything I was wasting in my life. And this was what put me onto bodybuilding. This was like, make something out of your life. Don't waste yeah. it. We had, we had obviously a really cool conversation. Like this, like, I didn't even know this about George. Like this, like, George, what happened to George, this was his shift. Yeah. And I'm like behind and I'm going for a different journey similar though because he knows the sort of thoughts I'm going through yeah I understand how it, it's fucking awful dealing with the emotional fluctuations that come oh yeah there's points where you wake up and you feel like yeah I'm gonna fucking get back to this I'm adamant I'm good I'm gonna fucking recover I'm gonna smash life and then the next five minutes later you're falling apart yeah. and I mean you can't explain where they're coming from yeah, I, I I got told they were coming, and my dad was very good at trying to dig stuff out of me. He poked and prodded me to really find out where I was at. You know, he like I have gone from thinking I'm never going to ride a motorbike again to waking up today saying, "Yep, yeah, I'm definitely going to get another one." And then who knows when the next thought's going to be like, oh, "I'm not really going to do that." I've had some insanely strong conversations with all my family this past week. And I'll be honest, it's, 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 it's a bigger decision than just my decision to say, oh, I'm going to get back on a motorbike because they will be fucking fuming. I'll be honest, if I get on back on a motorbike. And that, that's hard. My as dad much, won't be. As much as it is your decision to make, you still yeah. have to consider the implications that that decision is going to make when you drop that pebble in the pond and the ripples go <laughs> to everyone else. Because they, they only they only got your best interest at heart. But the no, same... Same can be said with bodybuilding, though, because everything's a risk. Jumping on that bike is a risk. Doing what we do, there's a risk. It might be a delayed risk, but the risk is still there. It's, there's always going to be some factor of risk within whatever we do in life. But oh, yes. it's the severity of that risk and and the impact that's going to have on everyone else around you. It's uh, When you get told for the first time, they were like, mate, like your picture made me cry. And I was like, it's like... Mm-hmm. My dad, my dad doesn't cry. Never seen him cry. Still didn't see him. And even you said, fucking, it made you feel some sort of way. And my dad was like, he said he had to fucking pull over because he, he was driving when, when he found out. He said, when he saw there's the picture of me on the floor with my head on my mate's knees and the lady, Miriam, with me on the floor um, holding her hand. 
he said that. He said that got him. And I'm thinking, fuck's sake, like, why, why, why fucking me? People know that follow me on like social media and stuff, how much I preach safety on bikes. Like, because I was here this year, I had four blokes that I either knew of or I'd known who had been hit by cars or had accidents through no fault of their own. A guy who got airlifted, they thought he was fucking going to die. And he, like, he, he is so banged up still. I'm, I'm hopefully fucking still goes through and makes it. Um, but that was only a few weeks ago. Because I remember I did a story. I said, you know what? I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to ride my bike today. I'm going to go for a walk. I went with Kieran, a friend of ours, Kieran, when I walked with his dog on the beach, I was like, you know what? I'm not in a good mindset for it. I'm just going to go with a dog on the beach, you know, because this guy had been airlifted. He got sent through a fucking brick bus stop. Brand new Ducati fucking snapped in half. The bike was in bits, but he was in bits. You could see the picture of his levers on the floor where they'd cut them off him. And, ah, oh, mate. And then I'm that dude, few, like a couple of months down the line. Obviously, not, nowhere near as serious. Still serious, of course. Like, I'm not trying to take any alarm like, away from him, but just, ah, oh, why me? And that's what I'm thinking. Why the fuck was it me? Because I, straight up, I could not have avoided what happened. It was not my fucking fault that he twatted me off that bike. And now I'm the guy telling the story, you know? It's, I was trying to say, I was talking to Zoe about it, like it's not just the accident. No. The, the accident more or less has, has been repaired. The operation's done, you're here, you're still alive. That's the main thing. But mm -hmm. it's how what comes in the next 10 years, 20 years, what effect is this going to have? on mm -hmm. where you were going and where you're going now and that shift and changing path and i i heavily feel like that's something that needs to be compensated for because yes. that, that's not just okay you, you've hurt him he's been in pain for a month or two he's back to just doing whatever he was doing with his life like he could have potentially changed your life drastically yeah and i spoke to my the guy who's handling my insurance claim um and he was like, I says, I says, your case has been passed to me because it because of the severity of it and like your injuries and things like that. Um, he says, trust me, so something like this wouldn't be passed on to someone of mediocre experience. The guy's he's a motorbiker himself for 30 years. He's 30 yeah. years also deep in as a lawyer. Um, and he made me feel very comfortable that he was handling because that was my worry. I was I said, I didn't want to feel that I was just another guy putting in a claim. I said, because my life's fucking gone a bit on its head, mate, to be honest. And he got it. We had a nice little laugh on the phone. The geezer sound. He understands where I'm coming from, trying to make light of the situation. But he also understands the severity of what's happening. I've sent him all of my, all the, the surgery pictures, the picture of the damage, the state of the bike, the state of me, me in surgery, me out of surgery, the scar on my stomach and all sorts. And, sent him also all of my bodybuilding stuff because this is this is what I wanted to get across because people that don't know what it is. Yeah. Like I said to him, so mate, he says, I'm a muscle model champion for fuck's sake. And I know, obviously not in the competing world, that's not like a huge thing for like other federations, but it's a massive achievement that I achieved. And I still want to be able to continue what I'm doing because straight up, if that geezer didn't hit me, this wouldn't have been affected. Like I, I now have a scar on my stomach about seven inches long, right? I did not look at that scar for three days in the hospital because I was worried of how it was going to look. My biggest worry about all of it, couldn't give a fuck about the bike, couldn't give a fuck about my fucking kidneys and shit. All I cared about, was well, long and long and short of it, of course I cared, but I cared about how fucked is this scar going to be on my stomach? Because you see the movies, you know, when they have surgery and there's like, fuck it, they, they wake up and there's string and shit coming out and it's all jagged and you're all jacked up. But lucky enough, when I pulled it off, I'm so glad my first thought was, ah, oh, it's actually not that bad. It's, it's all right. I had a lot of like gut inflammation, you know, when you just swelled in the stomach and it's sore to touch. And I was like, Do you know what? This is, and it's healing okay. It really is. Um, but I'm going to have a nice little scar on my stomach. And the worry of abdominal control, for those, obviously, this is what, you know, you're trying to explain to someone who doesn't do it. But lucky enough, this guy, he'd had bodybuilders. Like he's done bodybuilders claims before. And he was, he mentioned about like the food bill going down a bit. Like he, he, he understood a bit and it was cool. Like, this guy's fucking Colin. He's fucking savage. I'm really glad it's him that's dealing with it. Um, and he was like, yeah, there's nothing you can ask me that I probably haven't gone through. Like, and I'm like, sweet, like this is, this guy's going to be the guy. Um, and he's, he's just, he's just there to help because, you know, the working situation, lucky enough, my job's amazing. They've contacted me straight away and just said, look, you're hundred percent covered, like sick pay done, full pay done. That's it. Chill out. See you when you want to come back. All good. 
Yeah. Um, and my job's 100% safe because some people wouldn't have even had a safe job. You know, I'm lucky enough I still get to coach. Like, I'm, I'm essentially going to be a full time coach while I'm busted up. So, this was to what them. it took. It took you to lose a <laughs> spleen and fucking bust yourself in a bike accident to make the jump. Hey, there we go. <laughs> but, you know, we'll see. We'll see how things go. It's cool. So, still get to pursue it. No, no, of course. I know you will a lot help. But um, it's going to be cool because I will get to put all my time into my clients and it'll keep me busy. Um, like, even some of my clients who pay for my time once a week have been getting full time treatment just because I was like, fuck it, I'll do it for you. Like, I'm here. Like, let's, let's go. I haven't got a railway to play. Um, but yeah, I'm very lucky. Um, it is a bit weird. You know, people say, oh, you're lucky. Oh, you're lucky. You know, oh, you're lucky. It's like, I'll, I'll, I'm lucky enough. All right. I'm lucky enough. But th- I have had a few moments. Like, I couldn't sleep the other night. I had my first moment of reliving it and like reliving the accident. And I'm not going to lie, it fucking sucks. You know, you, you're thinking about it. And you're thinking, why the fuck has it got to be me? Like, why? Why Why me? Why did you come after fucking hit me and nearly kill me? And it's, you think it's not fair. You know, it's not It's not fucking fair. Why Why me? And you are sitting there going, why me? And I couldn't sleep. And I was like, this is wank. This is fucking stupid. And so I'm sitting there for a bit, like four or five in the morning. Um, and then I level myself out. You know, you, 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 your thoughts are just coming out, you know, you're emotional everywhere. Um, another moment you're thinking, oh, yeah, but I was with two other guys. Do you know what? I'd rather it have been me than them two. Because I, I, can, I, can, I can handle it. I'm, I'm a fucking tough bastard up top. You know, I can handle it. Life has a funny way of doing these things to people that can handle it and can cope. Yeah, because, you know, two, like, two of the other guys that are with me were fucking both dads. Yeah. You know, both got two children. Yeah. So why, why, why not me, huh? Because two minutes before, mate, I was the guy at the back and my mate was in the middle because there was three of us. I was, I was the guy at the back and then... Two minutes, not even not even a minute before I'd overtaken my bud to sit in the middle because I like to sit in the middle. Um, then, because if it wasn't me, it would have been one of them who yeah. got murdered by this guy. So, um, like you said, yeah, we're hoping kids, huh? they've, got, they've got kids, they've got other priorities and things. Young like families. The implications yeah. are, they're not, it's not that they're more severe, but you get what I'm trying to say. It, it, to an essence, you're, it plays to your character, the fact that you're sat there saying, at least it was me and not them. Yeah. For them. And that's, yeah. And that's not even trying to say, oh, you, you're just saying it's probably a tough guy. But I was genuinely sitting in the hospital thinking, yeah, but I can deal with it. I can deal with anything. You know, I'm all right. I'm, I'm, I'm sound. I'm still here. I'm, I'm, I can still walk. I can still move around. But yeah, I've got a bit of shit going on, but I'm still about. Yeah. And I can handle it. Yeah. And yeah, it was cool. And like, like I said before, you've got too many positive things going on. You know, and what's cool is like, for example, one of my clients has got a fight this Saturday. I can now go watch it because I'm not working. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I'm like sick. I can go watch him and I always try to find a little positive. Like George, he's coming down, staying down local soon. So I was like, oh, I can hang around with George for a bit. And is you always, you know, you, you got to try to find that positive shit, shit. And now I can be, say, like if I have a client who comes to me in the future, I can now relate of a serious incident where I've had to have time away you know you're trying to find that like positive part of it um i'm gonna shrink which is gonna be a bit shit um i'm already four and a half kilo down uh so there's a lot of things that be causing that though man the reducing androgen oh yeah yeah. on. there's it's not all gonna be oh muscle tissue's gone straight away blah blah you know it's been it's been what it's been eight days so it's still it's still early. Um, I'm just making sure I'm not eating loads of shit, being all depressed. Hung, like emotional eating was a big thing for me before, and it only is only going to get me one place, and that's fat. So, and I'm lucky to still see the scale either dropping down or staying the same. So that's that's enough for me. I'm not going crazy on the food. I'm not training, so the expenditure isn't there. I've still obviously got a superior amount of mass compared to other people, so I do need a certain amount of food to maintain it. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna set a game plan with Joe this week. Um, I sent him a video about like explaining how things went, and he said he's taking a bunch of notes. We're gonna come up with a game plan. Um, I know I'm in good hands with it. Yeah, um, I've got there's a great there's circle. There's no one I'd rather have, you know, handling this experience than Joe at this point. Yeah, you know, you know that there's not gonna be a single stone left unturned. No, nah, and it's just you know, obviously being an enhanced individual, recovery will be faster than a normal person. Fortunately enough. And like already just seeing how my shoulders healing, I was like a Wolverine that shit quite quick, you know. <laughs> so, Deployed the BPC. Yeah, of course, BPC is going in and um, we'll see what he wants me to do. And it's going to be cool because I better document it, speak, speak about it. And I'm hoping like maybe some people can 
you know, listen to this, that are invested in, you know, what happened. Couldn't get over how many people. Shut up. People loud motorbikes. Um, can't, yeah, motorbikes. <laughs> <Funnily enough. laughs> um, damn, there's damn motorbikes. Um, car, but I did see, I saw like this couple like wearing shorts and t-shirt on a motorbike like coming back home and I was thinking, oh, put my head down. Yeah. I just don't want to. Just don't want to see it. Because if I did not have my levers on and my fucking armoured protection on my side, you wouldn't be here. Uh, let's, you'd probably be on a pretty good beer. Because I'm a bit of a lump and I had full gear, top to bottom, and it's, it's, it's a lot of money's worth of gear. I'm talking, I wear about £1,200 worth of fucking gear um, every time I go out. You know, you invest in good stuff and it will sort you out, and this has, this has paid its fucking purpose. I was talking to my old man because I from racing the grass track bikes when we were younger. He's seen so many different accidents. My brother's come off multiple times. And he was saying, like, one of the biggest considerations with any of the races was making sure they were at a race weight, like like a fight cap weight, like make sure they mm. was in a certain weight range. Cause it's not just for speed on the bike and all that, blah, 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 improving mm. performance, whatever. Is if you crash, if you're a spindly little fucker, chances are you're gonna hit the floor, you're gonna roll with momentum, you're gonna roll and roll mm. and roll and roll. With you. You're a big mm. fucking lump. When you hit the floor, yeah. that's 100 and what, 110 close to kilos fucking just going yeah. and hitting that impact. Mm. That's a lot of think... a 60 kilo bloke falling off a bike. Yeah, I, de I, I definitely slid a lot less than my bike did. My bike went fucking miles, mate. It slid, crash protection ripped out the frame, the whole side of the bike, front to back. And the bike didn't flip though, lucky enough. Bits obviously everywhere. Um, but I was mad like when you bust up on the floor you don't even care like you're too busy focusing on how busted you are to be honest um, I was sick as we are now like eight odd days past it I'm still I'm walking about you know I'm walking through the town you know I'm all, people think I'm normal just like, um, like even the people in the bar was like how oh, you been I was oh, I had a bit of a week you know and that's all I said that's it I was like, oh, I had a bit of a week you know it's, like, not, worth, it. it's not worth explaining it <laughs> Nah, <laughs> just pull the top up, just get the scar out, but look back, this shit week. Just yeah. cut me air, fuck off. <laughs> what, was, what was mad is like, um, just like holding stuff. This is your strength ain't quite there. Like, yeah. if, if and you feel feeble, like I was in Tesco and there was this kid that stood up really quickly in front of me, he was letting over, like picking up something. And I was like, get away, like, fuck off. Like, yeah, get, if he bumps into me, it's gonna hurt. And I'm sitting there and I'm in the car with my girlfriend, I'm thinking, say if something kicks off here, I'm useless. I'm I'm actually useless. Yeah. Uh, and it was, but I was thinking, like, wait till I'm better, then I'll knock him out. If anything happens, I'll wait till I'm better, then I'll knock him out. <laughs> 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 oh man. I bet it's cool because I, I can because I can cough without pain now. Oh motorbike, motorbike season. See, see what I mean? It's motorbike season. Yeah. He <laughs> is riding up the high street. Just being a dick, like I, I, I know, and people are going to think my bike dickhead. This and the other, but I promise you, people, I did not do anything wrong. I was going over around about, I hit him at thirty mile an hour max, 30, 35 max, honestly, and I was creamed in. I will, I will pay credit to that. Whenever Alda sank stupid on a bike, he will tell me. Yeah, and, and he, he's always honest about it. So when he says he was fully levered up and he was, you know, driving sensible, I do believe him because he's honest about yeah. it. He does drive like it a was. Dick. It was a chilled ride because one of the guys I was out with was out with, you know, the guy with the Ducati, he was out with him on that day and he wasn't even that long ago. And he, he was just chilled and he was a pacemaker. He's, he's one of the older guys. You know, just follow his pace and he was just cruising. That's sweet. If he wants to go cruising, then we'll cruise then. If you want to go fast, we'll go fast. But at this point, no, nah, just nipping over the roundabout. Boom. I literally looked to my left and it was just, didn't even have time to say anything. It was just there. And... <clears throat> creamed in and obviously I've blabbered on for long enough everyone knows the rest now um, but the important thing is and I stress this you are still fucking here I am still fucking here mate it's uh, unfortunate enough I I can't I've come away from this in a lot better place than I thought I would because in the hospital it sucked ass I didn't quite know what was going to go on but to be where I am now Everyone's looking out for me, looking after me as best they can. Like I'm back home, I'm cool. Can still move shit. You know what I mean? I'm for a geezer who's in hospital on a bed folded a week ago. I'm doing all right, you know. Yeah. But uh, and yes, hopefully 
I can receive a wonderful claim at the end of this, which fucking pays my twos. <laughs> but that is a long, a long way ahead. It's not so much the material factor of the bike, man. Like I said, it's that compensation for the fucking impact this is going to have on your life. Because yeah. until until we know, you're not you're not really sure what that implication is going to be. Yeah, but mate, it's, um, yeah, I think I said to Zoe the minute it happened, like this isn't the actual physical side of this isn't the hard bit. It's going to be uh-huh. some shit recovering. But it's yeah. that mental battle you have with yourself over the next few months where there's going to be shit days and there's going to be days where then phone calls are needed, man. Trust me, I'm, I'm yeah. there. Oh, it's, yeah. Uh, you, know, you know you're there at the end of the phone. It's um, like I looked at myself in the mirror like the other day. I was thinking, you look like shit. It's, you know, you're, it's already begun, you know, because you're not training. You know, mate, you might as well just don the XL for a long time and not even look at it because it's only going to go downhill, you know. Uh, but swallow right. it. Providing that you come out the back end healthy, mm. there's no reason why you can't have it back in a month, man. You know exactly. That. We all know muscle memory. We all know fucking. You, you just ditch weights training straight off the bat. You know you're not nourishing yourself as well. You're not taking as much gear. Do the maths, mate. Of course, it's gonna go downhill. But as soon as it goes back in, hey, we might be looking at a lovely little rebound. You know, yeah. let's see the positive on that front. Um, but it's not like it ain't over. Of course, it ain't over. Like training things like that. It's just we're playing things by year, still early. But what's cool is I am still about. Yeah. I am still about. It's fucking um, deep. It is deep, mate. It, it is that, deep. That that dickhead on the bike rising past a minute ago. The shit realization is that now that it's bike season, there's probably gonna be fucking five, ten plus more people that all go through this shit. And sadly I mean, some yeah. of them ain't gonna be as lucky as what you are. No. And I, I can even I can already imagine how many accidents happened in the past week. Like, if you see an ambulance going by on a sunny day, you just you, I reckon it's a motorbike accident nine times out of ten. I mean, me, and, me and Joe spoke about the bikes of the weekend because so I said to you I'd love to get Harley one day. I'm not into racing bikes, but I'd love an old school cruise or something to toy around. Yeah. I said, Joe, I was like, mate, fuck the bike. I don't fucking want it. I literally that thought left my the minute you rang me and told me that, mate, burn them. Fuck it. I'd rather burn set the money on fire than buy a bike. Just because it's not yeah. worth it. Joe said the same thing. He was looking at bikes with Kirkham and he literally said, I, I generally don't want one. Wow. <laughs> what? Because they it's, looked at that. <laughs> yeah, man. It, it, there's something positive comes out of a negative situation here. Like seeing what's happened to you will have an implication to people, will make them make the right decision here. I'm still a firm believer that bikes aren't built for the UK fucking roads. The same way that Ferraris and Lambos aren't built for the UK roads, man. Yeah. The UK roads are shit. They're fucking overpopulated. And all of us UK people drive like wankers. Mm-hmm. We do. Uh, it's just not safe for bikes. Like track days, fl- go mad. Go wild. Do you. You're in the right environment. Perfect road conditions. Oh, yeah. Perfect. This is, this is a good time to say to people, like, I, I do ride track days as well. And i tell you one thing. You will not feel safer riding a motorbike than you will on a track day. For example, Brands Hatch is one of the most well-kept tracks in the country. It's like expensive. That. Pardon? I'm talking about that. Mate, beautiful. The tarmac is beautiful. Honestly, it is so black and it's so smooth. You will not have one bump across the whole thing. So I mean, shout they, out to Wilson Tarmac. They might they might have had it redone since we done it. It was like fucking good like decade ago, but it was Okay, good. Gotcha. But um, <laughs> it, what's cool is track days, yeah, they cost a few quid. But... um. That's if I'm probably going to go back on to riding bikes, things like that in the future. I will be, it will be a track based bike. Um, purely because the reason why I crashed was because of a car. You know, the only way I'm going to crash on a track day is either another bike hitting me or driver or rider error when yeah. you send yourself off. But lucky enough, there's, there's runways, there's an ambulance 200 meters away from you at all times. There's also a fucking recovery truck 200 meters away from you at all times. You, you're in the best environment possible to ride a sports bike or to ride any motorbike. And it's, and it's cool. When you're six man up in a straight line down a straight to 130 mile an hour, I'll tell you what, mate, that gets you. Like, I remember looking like left and right. It's like, just noise, mate. You're full on, like, no, 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 no. Like, I can send it. You need, this is listening to how passionate you talk about bikes as well. I mean, there's another reason why I'm adamant. I, I just pray that you do go to a track day. And even if you just fucking cruise around it at 10 mile an hour, I don't care. Just sit back on that bike. So you don't live with that for the rest of your life. Yeah. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be the guy who never sits on a motorbike. I'm going to tell you that. Now. I'm not yeah. built like that. It won't sit. I, 
No, I, I spent 24 years wanting to get my proper bike license. I've ridden Wee 50s, quads. I had a moped. I rode motocross for numerous years. And then I got my big bike and then I got a bigger bike and then I sold one of them and I did track days and bikes my shit. And it's, it's, not, it's not just going to die away. But I have had obviously serious thoughts last week. Um, my family would be very upset to find out if I made that decision already. But lucky enough, they probably don't watch the podcast. Um, but uh, so please, no one send this to my mum. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm in definitely a better place of it. And then, then like, once the emotions settle, I like my dad said to me, he said, It's too early to make a decision, mate. And what someone else said to me was my girlfriend's mum, she was like, because she rides bikes too, she was like, Don't make a decision while she got that shit going into your fucking veins. You know, we send you a little bit loopy. You don't, it's not the time to be making decisions like that. Um, the main thing first is see how my health is. See what my potential is. Um, regards to coming back to training, see how we're going. I'm I'm feeling good again. I can actually feel like I can tense my abs now, which is really strange. It's really weird. I wonder how they're gonna look. If they're pissed, I'm gonna be pissed, mate. I'm I'm pissed. the club. My abs are pissed anyway. I was born like it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I have a really nice midsection when I'm shredded. Maybe you won't be muscle model anymore. Maybe we all have to be a big ugly bodybuilder. We have to big ass ugly bodybuilder. <laughs> Man, yeah, it's been an absolute fucking roller coaster the last few weeks, to say the least. Yeah, what's uh, what's gone on your end anyway? <laughs> just mate, just prep. It's pretty after this, it sounds fucking pretty basic, <laughs> you know, yeah. just get it done. Calorie deficit, <laughs> fat coming off, training's killing yeah. me, but yeah, yeah, it's all gravy, man. It's all gravy. I was actually, um, I'm pretty impressed with my look this far out, to be honest. I'm yeah. very, I am too. When you sent, like George was sending me pictures in the hospital, same drills, every check-in, we send each other our photos, that's how we do. And we do not hide our fucking feelings with it. We tell people that is. Yeah. But what I do love is what I love to see a trait with George. You know George is more confident in how he looks because he sends you more pictures every week. You'll get like seven, the start of prep, like off-season six, seven. And then it will get become like the 10 to 12. And now I'll get like 30 pictures. So I know, I know he's happy with how things are looking. You know, just read between the lines on that one. Yeah, no, always. It's standard procedure. Got, got to send my checking shots over to Al. And this isn't for gas for people listening. It's not so Al could be like, oh, bro, yeah, you're looking sick. I want him to critique me. I want him to be like, nah, this looks shit. Sort that out. But say, for example, tell him what I said to you from the last ones. Ah, oh, but the side tricep. We, 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 won't yeah. talk about, we won't talk about the quarter turn because we disagree on that one. <laughs> but in the, in the side tricep, but, uh, there's something within the shot that doesn't quite look right and I couldn't I couldn't piece together whether it was me posing whether I need to tweak something with my arms set up feet set up change the you know change the roots up and uh it, we come to the decision it was generally just because my my chest is a lagging body part it's, it doesn't in the side chest it looks good and then when I put the arm behind the back and the side tricep it hides it away um and it's yeah. not something I can tweak with posing sadly this is just where I'm at within my muscularity and it's mm. hopefully in a few years it'll look better but the only way you can hide that is by doing your side tricep like some other din loads doing, do the leg to the front. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Like the side, not the side tricep, but that one. Um, but here's one thing, you know, you're not going to have a, no one's going to have a perfect physique in every single shot. If you do, you'd be, you'd be Phil Heath. Exactly. But what, what I love about seeing the physique come together is every week you'll see, okay, now this shot's good. And before you know it, you've got, you know, 10 out of 12 different style of bodybuilding shot that all look amazing. Yeah. You've just got two that aren't as, they're still good. They're just not as good. Yeah. So they're the ones yeah. we talk about. Like, how can we change this? What's this? Look like, da, da, da. Oh, this is good. Da, da, da. We know this has always been strong for you. Oh, this has come up a lot, blah, 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 blah. you know? And it's but, not like, yeah, bro, fucking savage, mate. Yeah. It's not I how, I, I mean, it's not how neat me or our work. I can speak for myself and say like the, the gas stuff. I don't, I'm not saying I don't appreciate it when someone comments on a post or says you're looking good or saying like, oh, of course I appreciate it. It's nice, but it's not something I thrive off. It doesn't give me like exterior motivation to keep progressing on because I'm a very introverted person with my shit. Like I like talking to Al about it. I'll talk to my coach, talk to Joe, obviously Zoe and, that's just how I keep it. I'd rather people be like brutally honest with my shots and be like, no, you need to tweet this because I want to bring the best. Yeah. But yeah, it's um, yeah, man, it's all it's all fucking grave at the moment. I'm just, weight's not moving, which is weird, but it's a digestive thing more than anything. My it's been so all over the place. Mm -hmm. so it's it's cool. like the 
Huh? It feels like the off season again, man. My appetite's in the bin. Oh, yeah. Honestly, I, I, I've never, I've never skipped a meal in the last what two, two and a half years now. Yeah, not miss a beat. Would not miss a beat. So even when I don't want to eat, food goes in. But it's weird being in that situation now when I'm eating less. It's not a bad thing. Do you know what I mean? To some extent, it's making it easier to lose body fat. But yeah, I know that something's not right. So I need to dive into it a little bit further. I think gone through hydration, gone through like food sources and stuff. I wasn't having minced meat. I was just because I was lazy. I buy my muscle meat chicken from there. And I can't be asked to go same just to get minced meat when I can just get it out of the freezer and just eat chicken. Um, mm-hmm. But putting that back in, as it's kind of had an effect and you kind of see that taking place. But like, some, something's not there quite right. Like I don't, like usually I've got a really strict bowel movement routine and I consistently every day, same time, same amount of times. And now I'm having like three, four days where I don't pass at all. And it's like, what? Still, I'm, I feel like the off season again. I'm sat here. I'm like, I look good except for the little pregnant belly at the bottom. I'm like, what's going on? And then tell them about what you did. Oh, mate, we activated the poop protocol. So <laughs> say, that, say that again. I had to activate the poop protocol. <laughs> if anyone knows about the oats life, you will understand where I'm coming from. So I have cream of rice in my last meal, right? Nice, easy digesting carb sauce. But there's something about oats, man. I used to have them for my pre, like first meal of the day. The minute you eat them, all systems go. The minute you eat them, it's like optimal digestion. Yeah. The last night I was like, ah, oh, fuck it, right. We're going to have to bring out the big guns. In come the big whopping 130 gram bowl of oats, all the calories macro tracked in. And yeah, today woke up good as gold. So I might not have solved the problem like at its root, but we've yeah. got a, a means to get around it now while we try and figure it out. It's a... Uh... It's interesting how you can be on the same food sources for a year, eight months, six months, no problem. And then all of a sudden, your digestion goes, do you know what? I don't like that food no more. Yeah. And things go wrong. For example, I before I was converted to the cream of rice line, I had oats for breakfast for three and a half, four years straight. Every meal, every time I breakfast, that's it. And then going to the off season... Oats would get to that 140 gram sort of mark in the morning. And I all of a sudden didn't have the appetite for it. Yeah. And I couldn't, I couldn't even finish the first few mouthfuls. I start a deficit. All of a sudden, oh, I can cram in 100 grams of oats easy. Yeah. You know, it's very, it very strange. It's like, geez, like two weeks ago, you couldn't even eat this meal. And now, now you're wolfing it down. Mm. It's all good fun though, man. Prep wouldn't be fun and exciting if it was straightforward and easy. But then again, I don't think anyone would be complaining when you're still eating the amount of food that you are. So I just done, I think it's just under four thousand calories at the moment. I think I, Joe doesn't give calories; he just gives macros. I think last time I worked out, it's about just under four. I've pulled off like nearly ten kilo already. Just, just as an insight to like how to compare two different individuals, my current calories before I got mullered was thirty eight hundred a day, and that is. 575 grams of carbs, 245 grams of protein, 60 grams of fat. And I'm putting on an average of uh, 0.5 to 1% of body weight per week, an average gain of a kilo per week, right? Gaining kilo per week. George eats very similar macros and calories, nice and he will, he will drop 0.5%, 1% to our body weight per week. Make it make sense. <laughs> no one could make it make sense. It's just um, yeah. it's just that off season push though. You would have landed eventually in that similar position because I my food went fucking high in the off season. It titrated up over time, and it was for this reason. It was so that when we start prep, we're in the most optimal position to avoid as much stress as possible. Like yeah, I'm gonna get hungry. Appetite signal is gonna go up when the fat comes out because leptin gets released and upregulates with fat loss. Them hunger signals are still gonna be there, but respectively the volume of food i'm eating that should cull some of like the digestive space and make me feel a bit fuller or so on you know all the x's knows so it was, it's all about making this transition as optimal as possible as easy as it can be right if you remove as many stresses as possible not to say that i'm not experiencing some stress because obviously my digestion hates me as per usual but it's interesting to find out like is it now becoming a more common trend with you and your digestion right Obviously, we knew in the off season like George always because we just put this one down to food. George eats a shit ton of food. Like, there's a lot of food, there's a shit ton of food, and then there's like what George is eating. Like, and it was, 
And it's not like, and George's diet's pitch perfect A to Z. It's not like, oh yeah, you just eat the bodybuilding macros. All his micros are perfect as well because George is perfectionist through and through. And you're seeing him with his berries, his exotic fruits and vegetables from fucking the London markets. And what's that? What's that kimchi shit you had? No. Oh, um, what, was that, what, was that, what was that leaf you gave me at your engagement party? Oh, what the pak choy? Pak choy. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know what this fucking thing was before he gave it to me. Nah, mate, Pak Choi is lovely. It's a good cruciferous vegetable, good for its antioxidants. Bang him. <laughs> Bang him over to that. Maybe it's all these fucking exotic things that have been busted in your yeah, inside. I've, I've, <sighs> you're, you're, a British, you're a British male. We know fish and chips, mate. That's all we know. <laughs> Maybe that's the protocol I need. I need to swap it out and get down a chippy, get some good grease fat in me. Hey, mate, get some curry sauce in you. That'll fucking get you going. <laughs> Oh. I, that's what I mean. Like when I was in hospital, of course, I was told when I go on Oromorph and all these drips, my digestion will all of a sudden just say no. And passing a stool will be the common question every day of have I passed one? Yeah. I went four and a half slash five days without passing, and I was getting worried because I was like, I pass a stool twice a day religiously. You know, I eat my food, I train, and that's just that's my protocol. I'm getting hospital, I'm like, oh, I still haven't gone. I still haven't gone. And I said to Nose, I'm getting worried. Like, and they're giving me a laxative every day. Every, every other meal, I, I, was, getting, I was getting lact- lactulose, this stuff. And oh, I'll tell you what, once you poop for the first time after a few days, it is, you, you take it easy. Because, you, you know, you have, you, your sphincter hasn't even opened in <laughs> numerous days. And I was told... I was told, do not strain yourself because you will cause pain yeah. and like it might tear something. Bear in mind, I'm trying to tense a stomach that's just been cut open as well. It's obviously helped pass. <laughs> and the first one was pathetic. It was absolutely pathetic. I was like, are these, is this it? Is this all I got? I've got like I, a week's worth of food here and this is what you're giving me. This is what you give. No way did it all get used. Hell no. And then what was it like? Uh, I got home a few days, a couple of days later, and I went for a Nando's in the evening. Woo! You want you want to help pass things through, people? Get yourself down to Nando's. Get yourself, <laughs> some, get yourself some hot fucking chicken thighs, some spicy rice, bit of mayonnaise, and all of a sudden you you'll see the drain plug get pulled. It, I learned, that's what I'm going to say to Joe this week and check it about, mate. Look doesn't mean anything you're gonna have to give me a refeed i'm gonna have to have an off lab meal nando's is needed to get me going oh mate it was i must have lost it was just it was just rather large everything that came out and i was like yeah now i feel better <laughs> don't need no lactulose no more i know the secret oh, oh yeah yeah man Right, guys, I feel like this is a good place to wrap up. We've had bike accidents and a hell lot of poop talk. <laughs> this is just this is just a B-Tech Foo and Aviad podcast now, isn't it? This is just a bro chat where they talk about shit all the time. Yeah, now we're talking about poops. Yeah, let us know your poop stories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mate, if I get DMs from people talking about their fucking shit, I'm going to be fuming. Uh, but now, of course, it was... It's cool to be able to talk about what happened and yeah. you know, to, to anyone that obviously was invested in what went on with me, this is obviously the best place to obviously hear what happened. Um, and I've had to talk about my recovery on here as well. Like, it's a cool journey to go on. You know, we'll always try to see a positive of it is, you know, there, there is there is an hour journey ahead and fucking like, I'm very optimistic of it. You know, we'll see. You know, who knows where I'm going to go with things. Yeah. And, you know, either way, I'm always going to follow George about the gaff, so... <laughs> we sadly we come as a as a duo now, man. That's just as it is. I, I think I think people are jealous of what we have, which is quite nice. Uh, yeah. They just need to find their fucking meter to latch onto, didn't they? Yeah, I found mine. <laughs> I found mine. Yeah, so guys, we should have some interesting uh, podcast conversations coming up. Like I said, I mean, it'd be interesting to see you from the psych- from the psychological standpoint of how this mental battle unfolds. And obviously, as long as you're happy being transparent with everything that's going through your head as we go through this journey, I think it would, it's going to be beneficial for a lot of people that may be in very similar situation because of health reasons, maybe 
affecting what they have planned or goal shifts and changes and how to kind of cope and how you're navigating your way around it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Oh, look, I'm always transparent with everything. I'm down. You know, people have been nothing but amazing responding to me. So, I'm, yeah, it'd be awesome. Well, then, guys, let's wrap up the uh, this long episode from us and um, we will be back next week. Peace, people. Peace, guys.